all right <coughs> now we want to do this in the case of compressive classification so for example we have y equal to phi x where x belongs to a particular class which you want to identify right so what do i mean by class it could be the image of a particular person or a particular type of object or it could be uh, you know a digit image from the mnist database for example could be any of these in addition to that there may be rotation translation changes so before the compressive measurements of the image was acquired the image underwent some translation or rotation which means that the camera uh, underwent some translation or rotation which we of course we are assuming in plane rotation in plane translation here all right so now what do you have to do <coughs> you have to search for not only the class label but also the motion parameters so this is the equivalent of a matched filter in the compressive domain and it's very cleverly called the smashed filter right so it sounds like matched but it's compressively matched so they call it smashed filter all right and this was uh, proposed by mark devonport who's a very leading research, uh, researcher in the compressed sensing field in his phd thesis okay so this was in about 2008 2007 all right so it's very interesting that you can do this kind of inference directly from the compressive measurements itself so this is also a very nice project topic uh, i put up some papers on this where you do other tasks as well not just compressive classification but even signal det uh, detection and source separation uh, and so on all right so it's a very interesting uh, uh, paper to read and to implement also so now what this means is uh, the following okay ultimately we'll be having uh, you know only compressive measurements of uh, the class you know the class x for example we'll have the true class x also but we don't want to generate uh, a reconstruction uh, from the compressive measurements all right and ultimately what are we doing we are just com comparing y with phi times uh, si theta i tilde right so basically what is y y is of the form phi times x where x is an image belonging to one of the classes so what are we doing we are comparing phi x with phi uh, s1 phi s2 phi s3 so this is what what are we looking at phi times x minus s1 which is a vector we are looking at its squared magnitude right so now <coughs> uh, essentially we are do just doing euclidean nearest neighbor so what's so special about what we are doing okay let us assume that the sensing matrix phi and hence the matrix phi u for any orthonormal u obeys the restricted isometry property then for k sparse signals s1 and s2 and rc delta 2k we have the following phi s1 minus s2 squared is sandwiched between 1 minus delta 2k s1 minus s2 squared and 1 plus delta 2k s1 minus s2 squared so what does this mean phi times s1 minus s2 squared is approximately equal to s1 minus s2 squared provided delta 2 uh, delta 2k is small enough right so therefore since it's approximately equal you can afford to do the nearest neighbor classifier directly in the compressed domain and moreover this is guaranteed to work almost as well as what <coughs> as the nearest neighbor classifier in the original domain right so this is good news because you are reducing the dimensionality and you are not incurring any error or you are incurring negligible error during the classification right so it's a very simple but very nice idea okay does everybody understand what this funda is basically of course it requires the images to be reasonably sparse in your chosen orthonormal basis so suppose <coughs> the images were let us say you know uh, face images then you can compute a pca basis which will be orthonormal 
right eigenfaces which we have seen in image processing class you generate an orthonormal u and then you see that those images are indeed quite uh, uh, you know they are quite uh, sparse or compressible in that basis. So, we are in business. So, of course, the other caveat is you need a reasonably large number of measurements your n should be reasonably large so that the RIP is satisfied otherwise the RIP will not be satisfied all right. So, whatever is there on this slide I have already explained. So, then there is a related theorem by Baranyuk and Wakin uh, in, in a paper which I have cited within this uh, these slides uh, which talks about some manifold properties ok. In effect it means the same thing ok it is not extremely different from the RIP result ok. So, I will in the interest of time I will not go into the details of this. So, uh, we will just look at a description of the experiments ok. The, initial experiments in this domain all right. So, they looked at three types of images a truck, a school bus and a tank and essentially they acquired compressive measurements of these three images and they wanted to find out what class those compressive measurements belong to. So, they used these smashed filters all right and uh, using these smashed filters they noted the classification rate which is the fraction of the correctly classified samples. So, they plotted a graph of that with respect to the number of measurements all right and uh, as the number of measurements increases the error improves and they also compared at different noise levels all right. So, <coughs> at different noise levels the comparisons were done obviously as the um, standard deviation of the noise increases the uh, classification accuracy suffers quite a bit. So, even at uh, noise of standard deviation 2 percent all right uh, assuming the images were from 0 to 1. So, 2 percent you got uh, tremendous uh, lowering in the classification rate. However, I would emphasize that the number of measurements here is very small these images were reasonably large 128 squared. So, uh, if you take a larger number of measurements uh, you will be in better shape than this all right. So, then there are also things like uh, if there was a translation you also want to estimate the shift uh, and the, the error in the estimation of the shift drops with increase in number of measurements a rotation angle also. So, obviously that is that is quite clear. Uh, so, uh, you know they assumed a range let us say from minus 10 to 10 pixels and then you search in steps of 1 pixel. So, yeah in that sense it is finite, <coughs> but you can re improve the resolution of your brute force search for the translation or the angles arbitrarily except it will become more expensive. Yes, in a way if, if effectively. So, the question is is this like treating every translation rotation and class together as a separate class the answer is yes that is just another way of thinking about it. It is just few more for loops over which you are iterating and I would emphasize no reconstruction has been done is directly from compressive measurements. Of course, <coughs> you know the measurements were taken by a rice single pixel camera. So, strictly speaking uh, you know if it is 0 1 measurements then RIP is not obeyed. So, you will have to convert from 0 1 to minus 1 plus 1 by taking pairs of measurements. So, last time we looked at the issue of designing compressed sensing matrices by doing a descent on a softened version of the coherence and the softened version used the soft max function. So, now we are going to look at a different method of optimizing for the coherence all right. So, this method does not directly target mu which is the coherence, but instead it considers the gram matrix uh, d transpose d where d is equal to phi psi with all the columns unit normalized ok. So, essentially what we now want is d transpose d 
to be as close to the identity matrix as possible. Why is this the case? Why do we want it to be close to the identity matrix? Okay, we actually we are not looking at incoherence between phi psi, rather we are looking at the mutual coherence which is the maximal dot product of any two different columns of the matrix D here, okay, maximum normalized absolute dot product. <coughs> so, what do we want? We want minimal coherence. So, the ideal case is when uh, you know all the columns in D are perpendicular to each other, which means the off diagonal values will be zeros. The diagonal values have to be 1 by definition. All right. So, you want it to be as close as possible to an identity matrix. Of course, you will never get it to be an identity matrix. Why? You never get it to be an identity matrix D transpose D. It would be 0. So, that that will be lovely. Okay. Mutual coherence is 0 that is awesomely awesome, <coughs> but it cannot happen. Why can it not happen? Uh, what is an orthogonal? Psi is orthogonal. So, what about phi? Phi, so one answer is phi is not necessary or uh, necessarily orthogonal, that is a diff different matter, <coughs> that is a different matter, all right. I am asking why can this not hold? The answer is extremely simple, phi is m by n, m less than n, it is a compressive setting, d transpose d will be n by n low rank matrix, identity matrix is full rank, all right. It simply cannot be exactly equal to identity, but we want it to be as close as possible in this sense, right. The diagonals of course, will all be 1 in d transpose d, we do not care for the diagonals, okay. we care only for the off diagonals. Okay. So, essentially what we want is d transpose d to be approximately equal to i, which means psi transpose phi transpose phi psi approximately equal to i, psi transpose phi transpose phi psi approximately equal to i. I am going to multiply both the sides by psi psi transpose. So, I will pre multiply by psi post multiply by psi transpose and I get this, all right. <coughs> now, psi need not be orthonormal, okay. In many cases it is orthonormal, but it does not have to be. I have given an explanation about, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have given an explanation about uh, over complete dictionaries last time, all right. So, in those cases psi psi transpose is not identity, all right. So, now what we are going to do is, we are going to do a singular value decomposition of uh, psi psi transpose, which will give us v lambda v transpose. So, I am going to substitute that, I will get v lambda v transpose all of this phi transpose phi v lambda v transpose equal to v lambda v transpose. So, we are going to do some algebra over here, all right. Now, v is orthonormal. All right, v is orthonormal, so we are going to remove v. Okay, so we are going to remove v from two places. We are going to remove v from here and from here. Likewise, from here and here. So since they are orthonormal, we will post multiply both sides by v and pre multiply by v transpose. So you'll get identity. So you can remove that. So we get lambda v transpose phi transpose phi v lambda equal to lambda. All right. For simplicity, we will call phi v as gamma, and so this reduces to lambda gamma transpose gamma lambda equal approximately equal to gamma. So, again, we are going to minimize this following expression with respect to the matrix gamma. What is this expression? It is uh, one matrix minus the other squared Frobenius norm, that f is Frobenius norm, which means the following. Okay. You are going to take uh, summation over i j a i j minus b i j whole squared. So, every every difference is squared and added up that is called the Frobenius norm all right. So, we are going to do this with respect to uh, gamma. 
So, what is known over here? Lambda is known. Lambda is known because you know psi. So, if you know psi, you know what is V and you know what is lambda. So, the only unknown over here is gamma. All right? So, I am going to show you how to optimize over gamma. Once you know gamma, you know phi because phi is gamma V transpose. All right? So, we will first optimize for gamma and that will give us phi. <coughs> so, now lambda is diagonal of lambda 1, lambda 2 all the way through to lambda n all right? and I will do the following. All right? I will take this gamma lambda and create individual column vectors of this matrix gamma lambda. So, those vectors I have just, this is just notation okay, to uh, uh, for convenience that is all right. So, I am going to do lambda minus something all right. So, this matrix lambda gamma transpose gamma lambda <coughs> I am expressing as the summation over i nu i nu i transpose. So, look at this each matrix nu i nu i transpose is a rank 1 matrix and I am adding up a whole bunch of rank 1 matrices to give you the full lambda gamma transpose gamma lambda matrix. Okay? So, the way I am going to do this is I am going to optimize for one particular column vector let us say nu j at a time. So, I will initialize my phi randomly. My psi is fixed already. All right? So, I know V, I know lambda and phi is randomly initialized. So, I will fix all the other nu i vectors except for one. All right? So, I am going to optimize one at a time. So, let us say I optimize nu 1. Then using the latest value of nu 1, I will optimize nu 2. Using the latest values of nu 1, nu 2, I will go to nu 3 and it goes on like this in a loop. Okay? So, if you see nu j, nu j transpose is a rank 1 matrix. Can I say the same thing about this thing inside this loop, uh, inside this circle? I am going to call it matrix E j. Is E j rank 1? No, generally not. It is okay, generally speaking it is not going to be rank 1 except in real pathological cases which almost never occur. All right, so, what do I want to do? I want to find a rank 1 matrix which approximates this guy as closely as possible. All right, so, which, uh, which approximates E j as closely as possible in the squared error sense. All right, so, what is the answer to this problem? Yeah, so, the answer is that we will do a singular value decomposition of E j and nu j nu j transpose is going to be obtained by the first sing, uh, 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 by the singular vector of E j corresponding to the largest singular value. So, the S V D gives us the best possible rank R approximation to any matrix. It may or may not be a natural image matrix, okay? any matrix. All right? So, in other words, the solution to the following optimization problem is given by the SVD. What is the optimization problem? Find uh, a matrix A hat whose rank R is less than or equal to the minimum of M n, where M by n is the size of A. So, I want to find a low rank approximation to A and I am going to call it A hat. All right? So, the answer to finding A hat is to do an SVD of uh, A which gives you USV transpose and A hat is going to be equal to summation over I equal to 1 to R SII UIVI transpose where <coughs> uh, U1 to UR stand for the left singular vectors corresponding to the R largest singular values. 
So, S11 to SRR stand for the lar R largest singular values of A. Alright. So, what are we going to do? We are going to use this theorem. This is called the Eckhart Young theorem, by the way. Alright. So, we are going to use this theorem. We are not going to prove this theorem. We are just going to use it in finding nu j, nu j transpose, because that is a rank 1 matrix. So, essentially what we will do is E j equal to U s u transpose. Why have I called it U s u transpose? What happened to the V? It is a symmetric matrix, right? It is a symmetric matrix. So, u is equal to V, right? Why is it symmetric? By definition, you can see that. The way it has been decomposed. Okay. So, uh, alright. So, lambda is a symmetric matrix, and each of these are symmetric. Alright. So, this is the kind of decomposition we do. Alright. So, we initialize phi to a random matrix. SVD gives us psi psi transpose equal to v lambda v transpose. We have gamma equal to phi v, and we do this for j equal to one through to m where m is the number of rows of phi. Okay. So, you compute E j, find the largest singular value and the corresponding singular vector V j, update these to find uh, gamma via tau j and nu j, then you compute the optimal phi. All right. So, this method is faster than the descent on the coherence, all right. but it is mathematically more difficult to understand. Also, it does not optimize the worst case coherence. All right, it optimizes the average of all the different dot products. <coughs> how do they compare? Uh, how do they? Okay, uh, the two methods. Okay, I'm going to argue that the one that we did is better. Okay, it is more principled. The gradient descent because it guarantees. Uh, reduction of the least coherence value, uh, the, the largest coherence value, which this does not. This looks at average case. Yeah, but uh, I agree because it is non convex. Uh, this is also a non convex problem, all right. I am not claiming this is a convex problem at all. It gives a unique result, yes. It depends, it gives a unique result if you start with a particular phi. Right. So, you have to do multi start in both the cases. <laughs> All right. Also, it is very hard to impose any structural constraints in the second method. That is, if you wanted to design Hitomi type matrices, video Hitomi's video compressed sensing camera, it is very hard to impose those constraints in here. The starting point of phi will matter because your gamma is affected by it. All right, so you'll find more details about this technique in this paper. They've shown that, as compared to randomly generated matrices, this design matrix gave rise to lesser, lower reconstruction errors. Okay, so the question is, how do the compressive classification techniques compare with the state of the art in machine learning? I will say they will not compare very well, okay? but the two problems are different. <coughs> All right. So, for example, you may want to train a support vector machine, uh, for example, on the compressive patterns. All right. The problem that will occur is every time you change the sensing matrix, you will have to change the training, which does not appear in this case, All right. because we are still using a simple nearest neighbor classifier. Also, right now we are not using any advanced features, we are just doing a basic Euclidean nearest neighbor. So, there is ample scope for improving you know the research in that direction. I have not seen advanced features being used in conjunction with compressive patterns. But at the same time, any time you change phi, you have to change your, you have to redo your training. Okay, so, so that is the answer. Uh, worst case performance bounds in uh, in compressed sensing, okay. The question is, 
we are being very pessimistic, all right, because all of them are worst case performance bound, that is absolutely right. Often times things work much better than what they have been promised to, all right, which is better than making a promise that does not hold true in practice, okay. But to answer your question, uh, to define what is average case, you need an idea about the probability density of the underlying signals, all right. So, you can fit different densities like Gaussian mixture models to a certain class of signals and then derive results just for it. But then again, moment you bring in machine learning, it all depends on how well your training set and test set matched with each other, all right. So, uh, that limitation will always exist. So, what are the open problems in compressed sensing? Currently, it is assumed that the phi matrix is accurately known. If the phi matrix is not known accurately, then this current theory does not hold. So, extending it to uh, the case where phi is inaccurately known is a challenge, ok. You can speak to your senior student Himanshu, ok, who is working with me on this problem. It is a very interesting research problem and it crops up in applications such as uh, the CT machine and MRI machine also besides others, all right. So, it is a very interesting area of research. The other I have already told you, if the psi matrix is not accurately known that also happens. So, that is there in one of the project topics, so, all right. Then uh, you may want to analyze different types of noise models. Right. Currently, we are considering Gaussian and uniform quantization, but you may want to consider more realistic noise models, Poisson noise, uh, multiplicative noise, which comes up in remote sensing applications, ok, where y is equal to phi x plus instead of y equal to phi x plus noise, we have phi, y equal to phi x point wise multiplied by a noise vector. So, this comes up in a lot of remote sensing applications it also comes up in ultrasound imaging. So, then what do you do, all right. So, th there are there are many such avenues for research. Uh, Gaussian uh, noise is it the worst case scenario, answer is no, ok. With Gaussian noise things are much easier to uh, analyze, because uh, first of all you get squared errors and if it is signal independent Gaussian noise then it is it is a lot easier because you can put uh, reasonable bounds on your parameter epsilon. If you have Poisson noise you cannot do that, because those bounds will depend upon the unknown signal all right, which is unknown of course all right. So, it is very hard to put those bounds. So, you need new kind of analysis for that all right. So, what is tomographic reconstruction? It is the task of reconstructing a 2D image or object from its 1D projections. I will define what projection means very soon, ok. Or a 3D image or object from its 2D projections, all right. Uh, for, for the sake of pure mathematics, it is the problem of uh, reconstructing an n plus 1 dimensional object from its n dimensional projections. But you know in image processing or computer vision, or signal processing, we care only for n equal to uh, 2 or 1. So, 3 D objects or 2 D objects. So, what is a projection also called a tomographic projection? Okay, it is defined as the radon transform of the image in a particular direction. So, I will explain this on this slide, all right. So, the aim of tomographic projection is to reconstruct the internal details of an object, all right. So, let us suppose this is an object and if you take a photograph, you will see only the surface of the object, ok. Like you know you take a picture of any one of us, you just see what is on the surface, ok. But you want to see what is inside, ok. Like you want to see the heart, the lungs, the spine and so on, all right. So, in the case of inanimate objects, Okay, you can cut open the object, but that is not recommended in 
uh, you know in many many cases okay but you still want to see what is inside so uh, the the task of doing so is called tomography all right so what is done typically in tomography is uh, uh, you compute radon the radon projections or the radon transform within the hardware okay so there's a hardware device that computes this radon transform for you so what is this radon transform imagine uh, you know f x y is my object in 2d and i'm going to draw these parallel lines uh, at angle theta with respect to some axis okay so in this case it is chosen to be the x axis uh, x axis over here the horizontal line so i'm drawing a lot of parallel lines and imagine i am adding up all the pixel values that fell on this line l at this chosen offset okay and uh, at this chosen angle so uh, in other words you know imagine i'm passing needles through this object and then whatever is collected along the surface of this needle is being added up all right and that is called as the radon transform uh, of this object at this angle alpha of course you are you are passing needles uh, in parallel so there are many needles all parallel to each other and each of them gives you one value so this 2d object is shrunk to a one dimensional vector all right so then you are going to repeat this process at other angles and you will uh, collect together a whole bunch of radon transform values at different angles theta all right and this collection is called the radon transform at all these different angles all right so uh, each summation is called as the bin of the tomographic projection so these are interchangeably called tomographic projection radon projection projection or sinogram they all mean the same thing all right so the job is you're going to be given a collection uh, you know of tomographic projections at known angles theta and your job is to reconstruct the object f fxy not just the surface but the internal details as well okay is this is the aim of tomography clear to everybody in the audience what we are trying to do all right so those of you who have been taking a medical imaging course you would have seen this before okay but let me emphasize that uh, we will be studying tomography in this course from a completely different perspective uh, than what is taught in a typical medical imaging course all right so tomography is very widely used in medicine it's part and parcel of your computer tomography or ct machine okay so your ct machine has software to do reconstructions like what i mentioned and it has hardware to measure radon transforms as well okay but ct machines or tomography is not used only in medicine it's used in industry in mechanical engineering also to study the internal details of a machine to check whether you have a crack inside the machine or a fault inside it's used in seismology it's used in biology also in virology so there are many many other applications and they all give rise to different flavors of tomography so particularly we are going to see it uh, we are going to look at a very nice flavor of tomography in the context of virology as we proceed okay yeah the pixel values internally actually there's an integration operation going on all right so you are integrating all the stuff that occurred along this particular line yes okay so let us not for the time being assume that this is digitized okay just assume that this is an analog object and an analog line all right <laughs> because that is actually more realistic all right all right digitization is something that we computer scientists create for our convenience all right so for example when x ray beams are passed through a person's body okay right this is the, the x ray beam doesn't know any pixel actually so for every alpha we have different s s indicates the offset all right so, uh, 
yes from not just one vector but many such vectors right and this is a very very active area of research in fact it's a very successful area of research in image processing all right so the aim is to reconstruct the 2d image from a collection of its 1d projections in different angles okay so now what does this mean okay uh, so imagine there is an object over here and you are passing an x-ray beam through it <coughs> okay you are passing an x-ray beam and uh, so the, the object is only here it is a circle everything outside is vacuum all right so when you pass the x-ray beam uh, nothing much is happening over here the only place where you are going to get some non-zero values is in the center over here because these values are non-zero and this is at one particular angle which is 0 degrees now I am going to redo this for 90 degrees so I will get another projection and uh, you know I will get values along this over here so now the aim is you are going to collect such measurements and you want to get back the object so what is the most intuitive thing you would do you know you will do something called as back projection you are going to smear the projection values in this direction right so I have marked out these arrows in this direction you are going to smear the projection values so what you are going to get is this rectangular band right why is this like a rectangular band yeah anything along that path would have produced the same uh, projection right so you do not know the translation along that direction at all all right so it could be anywhere so what you are going to do is you are going to take the projection values and this just smear them all along the object all right you just smear them all along then you are going to repeat this for the next angle and what is going to happen wherever you get close to the original object position you are going to start getting larger values because more things are going to get added up over there okay this is called as back projection so this is only two angles all right we are going to do this with multiple angles all right so given the 1d signal which we call a projection signal we try to reconstruct the original 2d image by smearing backwards along the direction of projection this is called back projection <coughs> the 1d signal that was measured is duplicated along the columns of the image to be estimated okay so I have got these directions marked out in yellow color okay and this is the red rectangle is where you are going to get the large uh, large values okay so given projections in k different directions we can hope to reconstruct the original image by performing back projection along all these directions and adding up the results all right so here is what we are going to do all right so back projection i have already explained so you are going to get something like this all right so this is a toy image which is a so the black is just vacuum and you have got a white square in the middle all right and you have taken a projection in this direction so when you smeared it back you got this then you took yet another in, in let us say 90 degrees when you smeared you got this then you take took one more 45 degrees and you get this and 135 degrees and so on so this is a case where I have got all angles from 1 to 180 degrees all right uh, and this is the result I get so what do you have to say about this result it's obviously it's much better than whatever we've seen so far but it is blurry nevertheless okay it's very blurry there are ghost artifacts like there's a halo around that white square okay which is no business being there actually so we will analyze the cause of this blur in detail okay there is a reason why it is occurring so it turns out you can increase the number of angles arbitrarily you can make it you know from 1 to 360 also I am sorry from 1 to 180 in steps of half or 1 fourth and you will not get a much better result than this for a reason that I will explain to you most probably next class all right 
So, this is called the back projection technique all right and it yields suboptimal results. Here is a checkpoint question suppose instead of sampling only from 1 to 180 degrees I went all the way from 1 up to 359 or 360 degrees what is going to happen is this result going to improve no why not. Yeah, so, theta and 180 minus theta are basically the same direction. So, whether you add from left to right or right to left does not matter right. So, it does not really help even for a circle it will not work all right and I will explain the reason right now it is uh, it is not easy to explain I need some equations yeah. Uh, no in this case <laughs> in the back projection I am just replicating. So, I think I should explain the word smear better ok. So, let us say I had a projection vector with values 10, 20, 20, 10 ok. So, I am going to replace every vertical line in this rectangle by 10, 20, 20, 10. So, I am just duplicating all along. I may choose to normalize, but that is not very important ok. It is not going to alter this result at all yeah question yeah if the image is not binary also uh, it is an equally sorry story all right. Uh, I have got such images later on all right. So, you will get this tremendous amount of blur and it is like a halo you know yeah in this case you may use a threshold. But uh, you know it will turn out it will work only for this image ok. So, it is not general So, the purpose of these slides is just to give you an, an idea that you you did this naive back projection things are not really going to work all that satisfactorily all right because it is the most intuitive thing that you can think of. So, now let us talk about 3D objects ok. So, 3D object is going to be <coughs> illuminated by an x-ray beam ok and this is going to pro produce uh, a 2D image all right. So, for example, when you go for a chest x-ray you know, obviously you are 3 dimensional and the chest x-ray is 2 dimensional all right. So, uh, you get one single projection all right. Now, from one single projection it is usually not possible to get the full 3D structure including the internal structure all right. So, a CT machine what it does is it takes x-ray images from multiple angles all right. So, when you go for a chest x-ray just a single x-ray image is enough ok for a lot of different types of diagnosis, but there are many applications in medicine where you want the full 3D volume reconstruction of your chest including the lungs the rib cage and so on. So, you are going to change the direction of the x-ray beam get yet another image and this set of images when back projected will give you an estimate of the 3D volume or the 3D object. So, if you did back projection uh, uh, like what I showed you here you can do this in 3D also. So, you will get a very smeared out blurry 3D volume reconstruction. So, in many protocols in CT however, each slice of a person's body is measured one at a time. So, it looks like something like this all right. So, you know let us say this is a slice of the person's body parallel to the ground plane. So, your x-ray beams are going to be shot uh, like this over here all right and you will get a 1D sinograms 1D radon projections for this particular slice ok. Then you will lower the x-ray beam and you will shoot the beam through this position you will get yet another set of projections and so on all right. So, <coughs> so now let me explain to you physically what this means ok. Let us say I naught is the intensity of the x-ray beam that was passed through your body all right. Now, what happens is when the x-ray beam is passed through your body the different tissues in your body absorb the x-ray beam to different 
extends depending upon the type of the tissue. For example, bone absorbs it very much, okay. lung tissue absorbs it less. All right. So, not all of it is absorbed, some of it is absorbed, some of it passes through the person's body and enters and is getting recorded by a detector. So, for example, if this is the person, these are the x-ray beams being passed through the person's body. Uh, depending on the different tissues, the x-ray beams will be partially absorbed and whatever is not absorbed is going to be collected by the detector. So, what the detector actually measures is this quantity <coughs> i equal to i naught e raise to minus integral over line L f x y d L. What is this integral over here? What do you think this integral is? No, what is the integral? It is a summation over in some sense over line L. So, it is basically the radon transform uh, at uh, some angle which determines the direction of the line L and at some offset. All right. So, it is E raise to minus a radon transform of F. What is F? F is an image containing the density values uh, of different points in your body in a particular slice. All right. So, I naught is the incident x-ray beam intensity and it is getting attenuated, it is getting weakened, right? it is getting weakened. Why? Because F contains all positive values. So, clearly I naught e raise to minus blah 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 is smaller than I naught or less than or equal to I naught. So, I is the recorded intensity at the detector. So, the detector measures that. This is called tomographic reconstruction or tomographic inversion. Right? And it is really amazing when you think about it. It is a beautiful problem okay, that you are able to see what is inside a person's body in, in this fashion. Okay? In a very non invasive fashion. Of course, MRI also does this, okay. it also estimates internal structure, but it does not follow this radon transform method. It follows a total, totally different type of imaging system, which has nothing to do with the radon transform as it stands here. So, it turns out the quality of tomographic inversion improves as you increase the number of angles at which you acquired the tomographic projection. Yes, so pure back projection nobody does. Okay. You, you will understand why, just, just bear with me. So, there exist lots of tomographic reconstruction algorithms including some that use compressed sensing algorithms okay. uh, and all of them work better and better as you start increasing the number of angles of tomographic uh, projection. Here is an object <coughs> and I am going to pass lines, parallel lines at some angle theta 1 and I will get a 1 D signal. All right. So, this is called R theta 1 of f, this is f. All right. So, this is one particular 1 D tomographic projection. Then I am going to repeat this for another angle. this is theta 2 and so on. <coughs> there will be yet another angle and yet another and so on. All right. So, the problem, the inversion problem becomes easier. It is easy to see that because the number of unknowns is the same, but the number of knowns is now increasing. Right. So, the system becomes less and less ill posed. But this case is not of much interest or not of much practical use. A very large number of angles exposes a patient to 
uh, more and more X-ray radiation. It increases acquisition time and it also increases power consumption, all three. So, there is increasing interest in getting uh, tomographic reconstructions done from smaller number of angles or lower value of I naught. These are two different problems by the way. You want to reduce the value of I naught also. I naught is the inten intensity of the incident X-ray beam, you want to reduce it. If you do that, what happens is the measurements become noisy all right? and so if you reduce I naught and or decrease the number of angles, the quality of the tomographic reconstruction algorithm it suffers. Okay? So, when you reduce the number of angles, you are reducing the number of knowns, when you are reducing I naught, you are reducing the quality of the measurement, the measurement becomes noisy. Now, why does it become noisy? Because it is low light regime. Imagine you take a photograph in low light, it is usually of poor quality. You improve the illumination, the quality of the phot photograph improves. The same funda is here. Yeah, question? Uh, no, not necessarily. In fact, in today's CT machines, you do not uh, follow this strictly. Okay? You have what is called as cone beam CT which shoots uh, uh, X-rays not slice by slice, but in the form of a big cone, which is a three dimensional cone and then you change the angles of the cone. Okay? So, it does not have to be, but when we study tomography, we start with this. <coughs> there will be theta 1, theta 2 also, yeah, that is right. That is right. So, we can call it direction of projection also. So, tomography is useful because it can distinguish between different types of tissues. All right? So, it allows for good medical diagnosis, CT particularly, right? computer tomography. <coughs> All right? Now, I want to emphasize that tomography is useful in medical imaging, but not only in medical imaging. There is much more to tomography than just medical imaging. Okay. All right. So now uh, I'm going to tell you about different types of CT machines. All right. So this is the most primitive type of CT machine, where you have a source which is shooting an X-ray beam uh, through an object. Then what you do is you translate the source. All right. Again, shoot a beam, and you keep doing this. Okay. Each time you ensure that every translate had the same direction theta. All right. So, if you, if you have a fixed theta, you have got different translation values and each of them is responsible for producing one measurement. Then what you do is you change the angle theta and again you keep translating the source and collect a new set of measurements and you keep doing this for more and more angles. <coughs> right? So, uh, this is a very, very primitive type of CT machine, it is no longer used. The disadvantage is that everything is so sequential, one bin at a time, okay? so it is going to be very time consuming. So, instead, all right, there are other things you can do. All right? So, what are those other things? You have a whole array of sources, okay? array of sources. Uh, in this form, all right, and so you don't shoot only one X-ray, but a whole beam of X-rays through a person's body at a particular direction theta, and then you'll collect one radon projection, all the values simultaneously. Then you change the theta, all right, and uh, you collect another set of radon measurements in parallel, and so on. So it's faster. Right, is that clear? So, there are different types of architectures uh, uh, of CT machines of increasing complexity. Uh, another uh, case over here is where you have a ring of detectors 
So, here is where the object is going to be like the patient sitting here, there is a ring of detectors outside the patient all right and you have a source emitting x-rays in this conical fashion. So, when you sh shoot beams in this conical fashion, you will be able to record measurements at all these detectors. Then you will rotate the source and then next time you will get a set of measurements like this and so on. Yes, the distance is given to you. The distance between the object and the detector and the source is all known. So, it is there in the CT machine is when it is calibrated. Right. So, these are different architectures of CT machines. We are not going to go into a lot of depth, but I just wanted to tell you. So, this thing was called a first generation CT right? and it was independent slice by slice CT. Right. Then uh, many more generations have uh, uh, have come forth. Okay. So, you got second generation CT where you, you do this in the form of a cone. So, this is second generation and this is fourth generation and so on. Okay. There are many more generations up to seventh or eighth in fact. Okay. So, this is the fourth generation. So, you can look at the textbook classic textbook by Gonzalez for this particular uh, part. I will all right. So, besides medical imaging what all do we have industrial applications fall detections beneath the surface then in botany also okay. we have got these plants the roots are inside the soil. So, you take tomographic projections of the soil along with the roots all right uh, in a particular fashion to get the internal 3D structure right. So, you may need to place detectors inside the soil sources may be outside the soil or vice versa right. Then remote sensing also there are applications right. So, the tons of applications virology I, I told you. Let us look at a mathematical expression for the radon transform. So, the radon transform of image f is going to be denoted as g rho theta all right where we are going to use this polar representation of a line. The polar representation says x cos theta plus y sin theta equal to rho, <coughs> all right, where rho is the perpendicular distance from the origin and theta is the way it is defined over here, is the angle between the x axis and this guy, that is the angle theta, okay. So, so what are we doing over here? We are integrating f x y along this line x cos theta plus y sin theta minus rho equal to 0 right. So, this is the Dirac delta function over here and the integral is from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, of course, uh, this is continuous when you discretize you get summation over x comma y f x comma y delta x cos theta plus y sin theta minus rho, where delta is now the Kronecker delta. So, you are looking at only those points which satisfy the equation of that line. So, <coughs> you know here is a circular object all right. In rare cases there is a closed form expression for the radon transform ok, very rare cases such as this one. Right. So, I, I am going to skip this math because it is straightforward as such. All right. So, it turns out that for an object like this the radon transform has a particular kind of shape which can be expressed in closed form in this formula, but most objects do not have this nice closed form expression particularly the ones that are of interest to us. Okay. So, here is another example this is an object containing two squares and this is the sinogram of this object. So, what do I mean by sinogram? You have angles of projection on the y axis and you have the displacement along the x axis. So, basically f x y has been converted into an image g rho theta, where rho is along the x axis, theta is along the y axis. So, this is called a sinogram the brighter values indicate the larger 
the, the brighter pixels indicate the larger values. So, in back projection what are we doing all right. So, so we fix angle theta k and for all x y compute the value of rho all right. So, here is what we are going to do all right. We fix angle theta k along which we, we are going to do a, a smearing backwards and uh, for all x comma y we are going to compute the value of rho all right and we are going to copy g rho comma theta k to hat f theta k x comma y which is the image obtained when you back project along angle theta k that is what we were doing over here. Now, your estimated image f hat x y is an integral 0 to pi g x cos theta plus y sin theta theta d theta right. Why is this case? Because this is satisfying the value of rho such that x cos theta plus y sin theta equal to rho or x cos theta plus y sin theta minus rho equal to 0 that is the line we are interested in. So, this is this equation represents that back projection operation which contains many many different angles right. Indeed all the angles from 0 to pi of course, it is not feasible in practice we have to discretize. So, we will have some k angles and each time we will get f theta k hat x comma y where f theta k hat has been defined like this right. So, you are going to get this kind of a summation. <clears throat> all right. So, this is called back projection and I want to emphasize this is not the same as the inverse of the radon transform all right. It does not yield you the true signal rather it yields you the original signal blurred by a kernel which has the formula x square plus y square square root reciprocal. So, x square plus y square raised to minus half all right. So, this is the result of back projection. <laughs> so, this is the Shep Logan phantom which we had seen in the compressed sensing example. So, this is the result of back projection at a very large number of angles. So, 0 to 180 degrees in steps of half this is what you get. All right. So, this is not the inverse of the radon transform. What would you think the inverse of the radon transform should give you? The original image back again. The radon transform is given by this formula. Right. Now, we are going to take <coughs> the Fourier transform of the radon transform keeping theta fixed. So, you know if I keep theta fixed I basically have a 1 d signal I am going to compute the Fourier transform of this 1 d signal. So, it is going to be given like this I am going to call it g mu theta where mu is for frequency right. So, the rho is being replaced by mu and the little g is being replaced by capital G. So, what do I get I get minus infinity to infinity g rho theta e raise to minus j 2 pi mu rho d rho right. So, the Fourier transform is over rho theta is fixed. Now, let us plug in the formula for 0 theta. So, when I do that here is what I get I get this beautiful triple integral, but this triple integral is going to be truly beautiful because it is going to simplify very much what is going to happen is there is that Dirac delta over there all right that Dirac delta is going to help us a lot. How? We are going to use <coughs> two things we are going to separate out the integral of rho in this fashion all right and then we are going to use the sifting property of the Dirac delta function and we are going to replace e raise to minus j 2 pi mu rho by e raise to minus j 2 pi mu x cos theta plus y, y, y sin theta because that is equal to rho really 
along the line that you are interested in, right? The radon transform considers integral only along that line. So, we are going to substitute uh, rho equal to x cos theta plus y sin theta and that is what you get. So, that triple integral now has become a double integral. So, now stare at the double integral and tell me, it tells you something about the Fourier transform of the original unknown object. What does it tell you? People have taken medical imaging course earlier, you can just hold your horses. It tells you something about the Fourier transform of little f. It is the Fourier transform of little f at a particular frequency. What is that frequency? So, it is the Fourier transform of f at the frequency mu cos theta mu sin theta. Right. So, let me repeat this result. Okay. The 1 D Fourier transform of the 1 D radon projection at a particular theta is equal to the Fourier transform of the original 2 D image at which frequencies mu cos theta mu sin theta. All right. So, this is called the projection slice theorem or the Fourier slice theorem. It states that the Fourier transform of a projection of the 2 D object along some direction theta which is denoted as g mu theta is equal to a slice of the 2 D Fourier transform of the same object along the direction theta, but in the frequency plane. What value of theta? How do I know theta? Because it is a direction along which I measured the radon transform. So, I know that. What about mu? I will not know mu, but I will be able to pick mu, right? Because I am computing the DFT of or the Fourier transform of the 1D projection. So, I can change my, uh, I can choose my entire range of mu's, and for each mu, I know that the Fourier transform value is equal to the Fourier transform value of the original object at mu cos theta mu sin theta. It is a 2D frequency. So, the 1D frequency is giving you a 2D frequency mu cos theta mu sin theta, which is very interesting. So, here is a projection in a particular direction and if I take the Fourier transform of this projection, I get information about the Fourier transform of the original image at that direction. Okay. So, some students were asking me how does tomographic reconstruction work basically. So, you see this is r theta of f. So, now it seems very magical right because I have got I have added up values. I do not know what the individual values along this line are. I only know their summation and there are many ways to get a summation like 1 plus 3 plus 4 is equal to uh, you know 7 plus 1 plus 0. Right? But if I take the Fourier transform of this, I will get you know, let us call this the u v plane. Okay? I will be able to get the Fourier transform of the original object at angle theta. So, I get all these values. Right, this really should have been like this, sorry. So, passing through the <coughs> origin, it is like a diagonal. So, now if I change the angle, I will get to know the Fourier values at yet another angle. And the more is the number of angles I take, I will be able to fill up my Fourier space more and more. So, then I just need to take an inverse Fourier transform, right. So, this is f, from f I will be able to get this, if I have sufficiently many angles. This is the basic principle of tomographic projection or tomographic reconstruction. You are basically filling up the Fourier space when you take more and more projection angles. We do not need all angles. If yes, we can in fact, we are going to see how to do that as well. All right. 
but classical tomography did not use compressed sensing. Okay, classical tomography began, in fact, one can say a few centuries ago. The radon theorem was, you know, this theorem actually was discovered by many people in different branches of mathematics. It became useful in the 1940s and 50s when people saw the connection to X-rays. Okay, and uh, traditional CT algorithms have not been using compressed sensing, but we are going to see how that can be used as well. 